Thanks, Yannick. Thank you. Uh, I think that, you know, living in uh, Finland uh, can also give you, or at least pose one of the questions which we ask ourselves very, very often, and that is, why hasn't Israel really succeeded in creating its own multinational companies? If you think about Israel, I think the, maybe that there's one, maybe two companies in Israel that can be designated as multinational, truly multinational. One is Teva, which is experiencing some of its own problems today, but is a truly multinational generic pharmaceutical company. The other one, to a lesser extent, is Delta, uh, which has become pretty multinational. We have other companies that manufacture outside, Nilit and uh, you know, many others, but one of the questions which, I, which intrigues me very much is how could a country like Finland, which is about the size of Israel, same size, I think. How many people are there in Finland? So you're smaller. We are 8 million. Create a Nokia. Uh, how could Switzerland create a Nestle? Uh, how could the Netherlands uh, create, you know, Unilever? And, you know, why? Is there something in the Israeli culture, among other things, the will to exit quickly rather than to build from the ground up a multinational company? So if any of you want to touch on that, especially you, <coughs> Avi, I, that would be very interesting. The next... Uh, speaker has a shorter and easier, easier name to pronounce. Uh, that's Ron Gura, uh, who is uh, the director, head of eBay Israel Innovation Center, eBay. Ron, you get the yellow one. Yellow one's better. Uh, good to be back in DLD. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Ron. I joined eBay about two years ago as a result of an acquisition of a company I founded called The Gift Project. And eBay has been very acquisitive in Israel and pretty much like my colleagues here said, that's a pretty common way for multinationals to uh, penetrate this country. So we had the shopping.com acquisition, which transitioned it into our big structured data center of excellence up in Atania, which we have uh, approximately 200 people at. And we have um, the fraud sciences acquisition about four years ago which is an amazing team of anti-fraud experts fulfill, fulfilling and enabling all the anti-fraud action on PayPal globally. And we have a smaller team back in Tel Aviv, which I had, which is uh, the Israel Innovation Center. It's a small self-contained unit, entirely off-platform, and supposed to check what's new and do rapid prototyping for eBay. And I think that's, that's a very interesting angle of how big companies or multinationals in general can, can test things. And, and I think the notion of putting that innovation center offshore, specifically outs of, outside of the US, is entirely untrivial. But I'll stop here with eBay and I wanna tackle that last question. I think there's a lot have been said about um, the startup culture in Israel and if we exit too quickly. And, you know, talking about these multinationals penetrating through M&A kind of brings that up again. Because behind any of those M&A, there's one or two or three entrepreneurs that sold their company. And the question is always, why or what if? So I think maybe Finland is, is the big caveat here. I think we're doing pretty well. And I might be biased, but... The question is uh, how many big multinational companies or how many billion dollar companies, as we usually phrase that in the internet space, can you really build? How many billion dollar ideas do you even have? How many billion dollar entrepreneurs are there really out there? I think per capita we have quite, off, quite a lot of billion dollar companies. Um, and to, to, to add to the interesting list you, you've mentioned, we have Conduit and Iron Source and we have uh, Wix and we have uh, Checkpoint and so and Fiverr and Amdocs and a lot of interesting companies that are doing really well globally with a headquarter and local founding team based out of Israel and I think that's totally untrivial in, um, in the situation we have and I think uh, this is something to actually take a lot of pride at and, and say 
some entrepreneurs want to build a bigger company and can. Not any notion, not every venture can even reach a multinational company level. eBay is mostly known as an auction company for some of you from 17, 18, 18 years ago, but the truth is today, um, less than 30% of what's going on on eBay is on web and around bidding. And mostly it's buy, it, buy it now, buy it new. And the focus on innovating and keep giving the customer what he wants, where he wants, how he wants it, especially through mobile, is, a, is I think a, a big focus for, for everyone here. And the question is, how come Israel was able to establish itself as that place, that center of innovation? Is it just the, um, the can-do culture? Is it just the, uh, the army experience my colleague talked about? And I'll finish with one, uh, the, the quick intro, with one highlight on, on the army. A lot has been said about how much young entrepreneurs are gaining from serving in the army. Or basically how you, when you're hiring a, a 21 years old engineer, you're actually getting someone with two to three years of experience. I think there's one point that needs to be um, taking into account, is when you're getting that guy with three years experience, you're actually getting not only his experience coding, but also experience coding back to back with the other team, team members that you've hired. And in a, in a reality that people understand that good teams, good self-contained teams are not a commodity, people don't take that um, is, a, is a trivial fact. To have a team that knows how to work together back to back, that's a big plus, and I think that's what really the army notion is all about. Thank you, thank you, Ron. By the way, that mention of uh, companies like uh, Conduit or Iron Source or uh, Checkpoint, could add to that probably Waze and a few others. Uh, it's an interesting question whether we can actually now proudly add them to the list of Israeli multinationals by the fact that they have actually been bought by a large multinational but are operating around the world. And are they keeping the Israeli identity? Are they keeping it by having the design center or some of their major activities in Israel? Are they losing it by becoming part of a large multinational? Uh, it's an interesting question, I'm sure. When Avi's turn comes, uh, he'll be able to comment on that as well. But now we will hear from Rick Kaplan, who is a country general manager for IBM Israel. Thanks very much, Dan. So um, first, let me add to your list. Uh, one of the great agrochemical companies, Maktashim Ogan, is here in Israel, one of the largest in the world. Uh, I think of Iskar as a great uh, multinational. Um, even uh, Israel Chemicals, that we think of as a, as a local company, has operations and sales around the globe. Uh, and then we called out a couple of others that, uh, that IBM works very closely with as well, like Amdocs, Converse, Nice, Verint. Uh, all with very substantial global billion dollar businesses. So uh, there might not, well I guess our, our one Nokia is Teva, uh, but there's a long, long list of other companies that have done very, very well in the global markets and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, in a moment, about IBM's relationship to those companies. Um, when you think about IBM in Israel, you have to think about deep, deep roots. We are not new to this game in Israel. Uh, we're a hundred-year-old company. We celebrated uh, a hundred years in 2011. Uh, there's a reason that we're still around a hundred years later and almost all of our competitors during that period. You can go back certainly 50 years plus, there's no one left. 30, 40 years plus, there's almost no one left. Uh, and even some of our competitors from the 60s and 70s and 80s, and I won't mention their names, but they're... Uh, they're uh, at risk uh, of, of being uh, part of history as well. So why is the IBM Corporation still here after 100 years, growing substantially healthy in its uh, environment? Uh, it's all about innovation. There's a culture of innovation within the company, and it's the secret to its success. We're not a company of products. We're a company of innovators. And it brings me very, uh, it, it's easy to transition from that thought to our relationship with the State of Israel. 
Uh, we've been here since 1949, uh, opened our, our branch right after the uh, independence of, of, of the state of Israel. Uh, but I I'm think IBM was actually the first, yeah. right? The first yeah, I, I, well. I believe so. I'm the yeah. great multinationals to be here. Um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit uh, to 1972. 1972 is when we all opened our uh, research labs here in Israel. Um, and the reason is simple. IBM has a simple, simple formula about where we put our work in the world. We put our work where you find the best and the brightest. Uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the world of insourcing and outsourcing and all those fancy new words that you hear people talk about, outtasking, uh, we've been in that game for decades. And we chose Israel as a center of research because the best and brightest are here. And that small little lab in 1972 that started out with four, five, six great scientists, mostly from the Technion, is now almost 700 people today. Uh, and after the United, you know, IBM leads the world in, uh, in patents every year, over 6,000 a year. Uh, our closest follower is Samsung with around 4,000 plus or minus. Uh, IBM has more patents each year than all the other tech companies put together. And Israel, our Israel lab, after the United States, develops the second most patents for the IBM Corporation. And we've continued to invest in that lab for that reason. You think about things like innovation, uh, one of our most significant customers, the Ministry of Defense, came to us and said, video analytics isn't where it needs to be for our, our uh, strategic needs. They went to work with our Haifa labs, and we developed some of, uh, of the uh, world leading video analytics together with the Ministry of Defense here in Israel, and we're in the process now of productizing it and bringing that solution to the globe uh, with its core in Israel and the innovation here in Israel. Um, let me go forward from there to around 2000. In around 2000, plus or minus, IBM became very acquisitive uh, in Israel. We started acquiring companies. And we've since acquired 13 companies here, most recently Trusteer in the area of cyber. Um, there's an interesting thing about this brain drain concern that you talked about. You can take every one of our acquisitions here in Israel and they've grown by multiples since their acquisition by IBM here in Israel. We have never moved any of those companies out of Israel and to the, uh, to the um, uh, benefit of the companies and to IBM, everyone has grown substantially and trust their uh, leaders in cybersecurity, which we just acquired uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, we're already out in the market in Israel hiring. Uh, we're gonna substantially incre increase the size of trust here in Israel. Uh, and together with that, uh, we're opening up a uh, cyber lab uh, in Beersheba uh, at the university. Uh, and Israel will become the center of cyber, cyber development for IBM. Um, now I want to go back just to 2000 for a second and, uh, and talk about another thing that, that helped IBM create relationships with companies like Converse, uh, and, uh, and Amdocs, and NICE, and Verint, and the list goes on and on. We created something called our Global Technology Unit, uh, and we're fortunate to have here Gabi Tal uh, in the audience. Gabi was really the, uh, one of the founding fathers of, of our GTU. Uh, and uh, the purpose of the, of the Global Technology Unit in IBM is to form relationships at a very early stage with companies. Um, to work with them on their technology development and then to help to bring them to the world. Uh, one of the things IBM can do for an Israeli company is take them from local markets and help build their capabilities globally. And it's a win-win for us because when we take those companies to the world, we build around their solutions and then we go together to our major clients in the world to get together with uh, Israeli companies. So our relationship, for example, with Amdocs goes back to uh, its startup days, uh, and we formed a very deep relationship with them uh, over the years. So that's, uh, I think, a fair synopsis of where we are here in Israel. Again, a company with very deep roots. We've been here for a long time, and we're going to be here for a long time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. You, you at least solved one mystery for me. I mean, for years, I was brought up to believe that IBM 
stood for international business machines. I now realize it really stands for Israel Better Minds. Right? <laughs> right, okay. You can pass on that message to headquarters. Yeah, we can, I think Avi can also help you design a logo for that, right? Okay, our, uh, our next speaker is Avi Hasson, who is the chief scientist for the Ministry of the Economy, uh, which is, I think, an encompassing name for industry, trade, commerce, and, uh, and the economy. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I know that somebody once told me that the world's three most common lies are the check is in the mail, some of my best friends are Jews, and I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. Uh, we actually live in an age where, contrary to the belief that it's all about free markets, and we want no government interference, and government should stay out of business, we have witnessed, not so much in Israel, but uh, certainly in the United States and in Europe, during the 08 and 09 crisis, that governments have a very crucial role to play when things go wrong or when something huge like the meltdown and tsunami of 2008-2009 happened. I don't think that any of the companies uh, among them, uh, by the way, the last one we'll hear from, General Motors, uh, will, would have been where they are today without government stepping in and doing the right thing. On the one hand, I'm a bit disappointed for Avi because I expected, uh, you know, with him being like the fifth speaker, to have a whole list of complaints about the Israeli government and why it doesn't help and what it doesn't do right, but none of that happened, which uh, I think is a testament to the fact that uh, you're probably doing something right. So we're looking forward to hear from you. Thank you, Avi. Thank you.